go to Acts chapter 2, and uh, we just, uh, we've just recently gone through uh, the day of Pentecost on our calendar, and I thought it would be interesting to actually talk about that chapter in the book of Acts, because every church I've been in in the past uh, wouldn't be allowed to touch that topic of 20-foot pole. <laughs> Uh, depending on the church you go to, you're going to get a wildly different sermon on Acts chapter 2. So what I want to do is go to the Bible and try to get an accurate impression on what happened in this very important service in the early church. So we look in Acts chapter 2 at the beginning of the passage. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So the first thing we see with the church as they come together on the day of Pentecost, they're in one accord. What does that mean, class? One group. They're united. United. Yeah. They're united as they come together. Awesome. Prayer. They're, they're not in different factions. They're not they're not there because uh Half the church wants Peter to leave, lead. The other half wants John to lead. No, they're united together. That's the first thing. And they are all gathered together. They were in one accord and they were in one place. So the church had come together. This wasn't the day in the book of Acts where you could ask your boss for Sunday off so you can come to church. Most of the people were slaves, even, and even the ones that weren't, I guarantee you, if they said, hey, yeah, we want to get together to worship Jesus, uh, most of them would be in a lot of trouble if they said that. So this was quite, quite a thing. They all managed to get together. They were unified, and they were all in one place. And so we see something miraculous happens in chapter 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So it seems like a very miraculous thing here, doesn't it? Tongues of fire come from, come from the heavens, and now they're all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues people would say oh that sounds like your typical uh, Pentecostal uh, uh, worship service or at least a stereotypical one <laughs> let's go a little further in the passage here and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews devout men from every nation under heaven and when the sound occurred the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Here's an important thing. That these people are filled with the Holy Spirit and they start praising God in different languages. But guess what? Everyone heard in their own language. If Jeff is speaking Russian, I'm hearing it in English. If Larry's speaking Japanese, I'm hearing it in English. What a miraculous thing that is. God was actually working this, showing his power through this. Everyone is understanding what is being said. This isn't gibberish that's going out there. This isn't la la lulu la la. They are hearing. They're understanding what's going on. Verse 7, Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language? in which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cap Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygra, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. So what is this going to sound like 
to the person that knows Jesus Christ as Savior. It's not gibberish, is it? It's not a bunch of people just babbling on. and They're saying something very specific as the Holy Spirit is causing them to speak. They're praising God. Proclaiming the works of God. Yes. This is a worship service where they are proclaiming how mighty and awesome God is. And everyone who knows the Lord there, guess what? They can understand what's going on. You see, I think where the Pentecostal movement misses out a lot of times, when the Lord does a work, he does it for a purpose. Whenever you see the Holy Spirit work in, in a certain situation like this, it's to give God the glory, not to confuse everyone. Not to have complete madness. Yeah, they're all going on in different languages. They don't even know what they're what language they're speaking, but they know what they're speaking, don't they? They are praising Jesus Christ. They're letting everyone know how great God is, the mighty things he has done, and then they are understanding. That's a big difference from what sometimes goes on in Pentecostal ser services, and I don't want to bash all Pentecostal churches, but I do know there are some who they'll say watermelon fast until they can speak in tongues. I've heard in Pentecostal, I've heard someone speaking in tongues and just speaking utter gibberish before. Not even a real language, just la la lulu la la lulu. That's not what we're talking about here. When you get to the day of Pentecost, you're seeing a mighty, miraculous thing. These people are speaking in languages they don't know, and then everyone's hearing it as their own language something amazing we have to remember that our God is a powerful God he is a mighty God the Holy Spirit is not dead I know a lot of times in my Baptist upbringing we're taught that that doesn't happen anymore I spent most of my uh, life in a Baptist church and I I love the Baptist church, so I don't want, I'm not trying to bash Baptists. <laughs> but they always talk that, oh, they've passed away. Well, first off, the passage they like to talk about is taken out of context. The Bible never says that tongues have passed away. The Bible never says that. And the Pentecostals take this passage out of context. What they like to say is tongues... They're, get, they're off target on it. Tongues are a message from God. A powerful message from God. I remember when I was in high school, an experience that changed my life and made me commit myself fully to the service of the Lord. Talking in Spanish, I'm terrible at Spanish. I can't carry on a conversation with anyone. Uh, if you ask me to witness to a guy in Spanish, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. And I knew that as a 15-year-old. So when I was on the mission field in Mexico, I hid out in the back of the group, hoping the youth pastor wouldn't send me to the front of the group to witness to anyone. Well, the youth pastor was more clever than I gave him credit for. And he knew I was hiding back there, and eventually I couldn't hide any longer. He pulled me up to the front to talk to this guy, and I knew right then and there I'm going to be embarrassed because I'm not going to have a clue what I'm doing. Holy Spirit took over. I witnessed the guy in perfect Spanish. That was the Lord. That was the Lord working through me. Don't let anyone tell you that gifts of the Spirit are not real. They are. They're not necessarily what a lot of churches teach. Because sometimes we've taken our own ideas, sadly, and taken them to the Bible instead of taking the Bible as it's written. But let no one tell you the gifts of the Spirit aren't real. The body of Christ is not powerless. Now, the people that didn't know the Lord, they're mocking. They don't know what's going on. So the people that don't know the Lord, what does it sound like? Yeah, a bunch of drunks run their mouth. But the people that do know the Lord... They're hearing, 
the wonderful works of God testify to. That's the first thing. What an amazing worship service that had to be. What an amazing worship service. For the last of three or four hours. Yeah, it was a powerful worship service. And anyone who tells you, wor- tells you worship isn't important, once again, don't listen to that person either. God wants us to worship Him. It is important to Him. You know, the reason we have a song service, it's not because we like singing. I do like singing, I'll freely admit that. But that's not the reason we sing songs. It's to worship Jesus Christ. It's to worship God. Over and over in Scripture, God says, worship me. God says he wants our worship. God says sing praises to the Lord. God says to testify about the great things he's done. Don't let anyone say that a worship service isn't important. But the worship service wasn't it wasn't all wasn't the whole thing, was it? Verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall see visions. Or your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So where does Peter go to to explain what's happened here? He goes back to the word of God. Peter's one of the eleven. He steps up and becomes a great leader for the church. But his foundation is not built on his own wisdom. He asked Peter how much wisdom he'd say he had. He'd say, I don't have any. Save for the wisdom the Lord gives me. <coughs> Peter doesn't sit here and make his own explanation for what happened. He doesn't make his own doctrine of what just happened. He goes to God's word. As this was such a pivotal moment in the church, Peter's setting an example that we all need to follow. How do we explain the things of God? We start with God's word. We start with scripture to understand the things of God, not our own opinions. I got news for you. My own opinions, they have some flaws. My own opinions can be mistaken. I can be in ignorance. God's word. God's word is never an error. And God's word had already prophesied this event. So we've seen a few very important things, markings of what the church is supposed to be here, haven't we? The church is marked. The power of God is present in the church. The power of God is present in the church. They worship the Lord, don't they? In verse 1, we saw they had unity. And we see as Peter preaches, he's coming straight from God's word. It's not Peter's opinion on how on what's going on. It's This is what God says. This is what the King of Kings says. So we move on, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands that have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the paints of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, 
I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So what is Peter doing definitively here? Where is the focus of the church? Jesus. The focus is on Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins and he rose again. Amen. You got to keep the main thing the main thing. The purpose of the church isn't to be a country club. The purpose of the church isn't to be trendy and... Uh, have the best uh, music band ever playing. Not that a band is a bad thing. Not that it's it's a great thing to, have, to get along with people and have good friendships. But the main thing of the church is Jesus Christ. The main thing is Jesus. And Peter is laying down the case. The scripture said this would happen. And guess what? It happened. It happened. All too often, we lose sight of that in our own lives. We lose sight of that in the church. We lose sight of why we gather together. We go to church because we always have. We go to church because what else would we do on Sunday? We can't lose sight of why we do this. Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins. He paid a high price. He paid with his blood. He suffered a criminal's death for us, and he rose again. He's letting them know that God had a plan from the very beginning. There's a reason Jesus let himself be hung on the cross, because that's the way God wrote it. That's the plan. God wasn't taken by surprise. God wasn't shocked at what happened. No, this was the plan. This was the plan to save us from our transgressions. Amen? Amen. Once again, what does Peter do? Once again, Peter goes back to the scriptures. If anyone could have some interesting opinions on Jesus, it would be Peter. He walked with him. They were like brothers on the earth. Jesus was his teacher. If anyone could have a ton of stories to tell about Jesus, it would be Peter. But what does Peter go to? He goes back to the scriptures. That is what his focus on. One thing we see as evidence on the day of Pentecost, a lot of people call it the birth place of the church. I would say that the church was already around, but this was one of the significant points in the church's life. But one of the things you see here is Peter is showing 
Jesus is the main thing, and we are going to stick to Scripture. This is going to be our focus. This is going to be what we build everything on. Jesus was obedient, too. Yeah, he, he didn't was. didn't want to do what he did, but he did what his father told him. Yes, he did. What an example for us. If Jesus is obedient to God the Father, what excuse do we have? We don't have any excuse. So we move on, verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You know what cuts to the heart of people? The truth. Their, their goal wasn't, okay, we're going to sugarcoat the truth. We're going we're gonna to be seeker friendly. And we're not going to really get people of Jesus right off the bat. We just want them to come in and enjoy themselves. And Maybe after they've been here for three or four months, then we'll start talking about Jesus. The problem that has happened, and I know some seeker friendly churches have found this is, Guess what happened after three or four months? Did those people have any interest in Jesus? Mm -hmm. They usually left. Exactly. What reaches people is the truth that Jesus Christ loves you. That he died on the cross for your sins. And that he wants a relationship with you. That's where there's power. It's in the truth. It's in what Jesus did for us. Peter didn't hold anything back. And what happened? What do we do? They were reached. Verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. You know, Peter didn't say, Well, don't worry, there's good news. You're already saved. So you don't need to do anything. There are churches that teach that. You know that? Sad. Because those churches are just sending people to hell. But there are churches that like to teach that. No. It's first. Repent. Turn to Jesus. Turn away from the world and turn to Jesus. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you believe in your heart that God has raised, raised Jesus from the dead, and if you, believe, if, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God that has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Repenting is simple. He tells them to repent. Afterwards, he says to be baptized. We know as we read through Scripture, you read Romans 10, 9, and 10, you read other passages on Scripture, they don't talk about baptism. Baptism doesn't save you, but it is something God wants every Christian to do, is it not? Why is it so important that we be baptized? If it's not going to save us, why bother? It's a public testimony of what he has done for us. Yes. You know, when you pray and you accept Christ as Savior, that's between you and God. Maybe one person will help you with it. Maybe there'll be a few people there with you, encouraging you on. But largely, that's between you and God. When I'm baptized, that means I'm, I'm publicly saying, Jesus Christ has saved me from my sins. I am no longer the same person I used to be. I'm a new creature in Jesus Christ. Baptism is important because we're not called to get saved and then tell no one. Baptism is telling everyone this is what Jesus has done for me. And then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit isn't something that comes and goes and comes and goes and Esther has the Holy Spirit one minute, but then it's gone until the next worship service. No, that's not the way the Holy Spirit is. When you accept Christ as Savior, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's there. It stays there. It's not running from you. The Holy Spirit is the comforter which Jesus promised in the Gospel of John. And it's not going to leave you. It's not going to abandon you. 
It's not going to take a vacation. The Holy Spirit will always be with you. What a powerful thing. God himself is there with us in our life every day. Isn't that a blessing? Who's thankful for the Holy Spirit today? Now, what does the Holy Spirit do for us? Many things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Comforts us. Convicts us. Saves us. Protects us. It, uh, the Bible says it brings to remembrance the things we've learned about God, the things we've learned about God's Word. The Holy Spirit does so much for us. What a blessing. Verse 39, For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Anyone who accepts Jesus can have this. There's not a select club that can be saved. The promise is for everyone. So we move on, verse 40. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So what happened with this powerful, Bible-focused church A church that was that let the Holy Spirit do its work. Three thousand people were saved, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayers. So this is what the early church did. This is what they focused on as they were coming off this great day on Pentecost. They focused on the apostles' doctrine first off. The idea is they wanted to know more about God. They wanted to know what they believed. It was important to them to understand God's word. Is it important to you today to understand God's word? Absolutely. You know, too many Christians I know, they have the attitude that they don't need to study God's word. They can just go to church once a week and the pastor will tell them everything they need to know. <coughs> Well, I'm here to tell you, I don't care if I don't care if the Apostle Paul came in here and took my place as pastor of this church. Even if the Apostle Paul was teaching you every day, every Sunday, even a great man like him, that would not be enough for you to just listen to one sermon a week and be good. Church is important. Good Bible pre preaching is important. But that is a supplement to your own daily studies and prayers. You need to know doctrine. So important. Understand what God's Word says. You know, great teachers can be wrong sometimes on one or two issues. Our goal shouldn't be to just understand, okay, I've heard every one of Mike Hill's sermons, so I know exactly what Mike Hill says about the Bible, and I'm good. <laughs> what if Mike, he's not going to purposely try to mislead us, but what if he's wrong on something? Mike's never wrong. <laughs> what? <laughs> you don't know my spelling. <laughs> yeah, what, what if he's wrong on something? Guess what? Now I'm wrong on it, too. That's how false doctrines are born. Study doctrine. It's so important. You can't know enough doctrine. You need to know who God is and about God. Another thing they focused on, fellowship. Fellowship. What does fellowship mean? Following Christ continually. What fellowship means is when service is over, that is not the end of our fellowship until the next service. We're part of each other's lives. We pray for each other. We gather together. Hang out on occasion. It's hard. We all have busy lives, but you know, we could all make more time for that. The body of Christ is supposed to be a body of Christ. If your arm and your leg were never in the same room except for once a week, how would your body function? If there's no communication between your brain and your uh, left foot except on Sunday mornings, how would your body function? 
I think we could all work on doing better <laughs> with that. Fellowship is so important. The breaking of bread. One thing the church did is they ate together a lot. That's one thing the early church did. They had a lot of meals together. Not just like Sunday. They yeah. Like they would come together. They actually were doing, yeah, they did it a lot. Mm -hmm. And we'll read more about that. That was something they did very often. That would be a good thing for us to do more often. Absolutely. And prayers. One of the focuses of the church, prayer. They were dedicated to prayer. They were focused on praying for each other, praying for their community, asking God's will for their life. They were prayer warriors. These are the things the early church focused on. What's not in that list of things the early church focused on? Spread the gossip. Yeah, gossip's not in there. <laughs> Video games. Yeah, I love my games, but that's not something to focus on. <laughs> if that's the priority of your life, you got some trouble. No politics. Yeah, no politics. No politics, that's a good one. You know, uh, Peter and John weren't arguing over who's going to be elected uh, elder. Money is important. Finances are important, but that wasn't the focus of the church. Sometimes that becomes the focus of the church, sadly. But that wasn't the focus of this church. They had a clear focus, doctrine, fellowship, prayer. And then fear came upon every soul. When we talk about fear, it's not a terrified fear that, oh no, we're going to get killed, we've got to run. But that reverent respect, that, that, wow, this is amazing, came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. You know, one thing starts to happen when you give it all to the Lord. You start to see God do great things. And that's what this early church saw there. Verse 44, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. The idea is, you know, we'll, we'll, verse 45, 2, And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. You know, they were there for each other. You know, if Brother Jeff has a need, I should be willing to help him because he's my family in Christ. He's my brother. I should be just as willing to help him as if I had a need. Why? Because that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. We're one body. All too often the church loves someone until they get into financial difficulty and then that person becomes a pariah. I'm not talking about the person who drank all their money away. They've got a bigger problem than money. They've got a sin problem. But, you know, someone loses their job, someone has a health issue, if you can help them, help them. And don't make them feel guilty about it either. Because the body of Christ, we're supposed to be there for each other. That's what the early church did. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So, one of the things we see in verse 46, they were meeting every day. The Bible doesn't say the church's focus is Sunday morning and that's it. There is nothing wrong there's no problem. It would be a great thing if, hey, I got some time free. Let's get some breakfast. How often do we fellowship with one another? They did it every day. How amazing that is. Breaking bread from house to house. They're doing, going to different houses all the time, having a meal together. They ate their food of gladness and simplicity of heart. There wasn't uh, some hidden agendas here. 
They're praising the Lord. And they have favor of all the people. Because they did things without hidden agendas. They did things God's way. They loved each other. They showed kindness to one another. They cared about one another. What did they have? How did the people around them view them? <clears throat> Favorably. You look at the news and so often it seems like Christians are so hated nowadays. In a lot of the media. And I think part of the problem is we need to get back to being like the church in Acts was. Well, we're not known because of scandal or because someone's trying to get someone else's money but we're known as people who care about one another who care about our community who love Jesus and love other people who tell the truth stick to God's word and actually live it in our lives you know if we could be Christians if we could do what the church of Acts did we would see a difference in the way the world views us some people wouldn't like us but you know what else they wouldn't have anything? They wouldn't have anything to say against us either. Because our godly conduct would silence them. And many of them would come to know the Lord instead. As we see in this church, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. I guess the one thing I want to encourage is that could be the church of today too if we're willing to let it be by doing things God's way and not our way. And the purpose isn't pointing my finger at anyone in here and saying, you need to do more. I'm going to point the finger at myself and say, I need to do more to strive to be an Acts chapter 2 Christian, to do things like the Lord did in Acts chapter 2. And I hope and pray you'll examine your hearts and ask yourself, how do I fit in there? How do I fit in there? Do I need to do more? Surrender myself to the Lord so I can be an Acts chapter 2 Christian. I hope and pray that instead of just looking at the day of Pentecost as an event in the past, that we can do what the early church did by fully surrendering Jesus Christ because we can still see mighty things today God's power can still work in this community today there's so many dying churches in this area but that does not have to be the way it, ha it is it all starts with us choosing to let the Holy Spirit work through us so that we can be his instruments just like this church was just like they were. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your word. As it is a guide. It is a road map. It shows us exactly how you want us to live, Lord. And Lord, I pray that your